He's coming. The marriage of the Lamb. Oh, hallelujah. Ruach HaKodesh. We welcome you here today. Prepare us for that day. Sanctify us day by day, Lord. So that we can be a beautiful bride for you. We love you, Yeshua. We love you, Avinu Malkinu, our Father, our King. We adore you. We worship you. We exalt you. You. Yes. Truly, a, a word has never been so truly spoken that you are God and we are not. You are on the throne and we serve you. Ruach, just manifest yourself right now. Where there is there is need, Lord, minister. Where there is pain, Lord, bring relief. Where there is discouragement, Lord, bring courage. Ruach HaKodesh just fall upon us this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. He's here right now. If there's a need, any need in your life, Just grab the hem of his garment at seat seat. He's walking amongst us, inspecting his troops in mercy, in grace, and in truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb. <clears throat> Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Shabbat Shalom, Beth Yeshua family. It's so wonderful to be here. Um, we love you so much. I bring greetings from... Uh, Congregation Beth Yeshua, North Georgia. Um, it's, uh, it's such an honor to be part of this family. Such a beautiful family. The love that's here and uh, the presence of God that's here is, is just tangible. And uh, I pray that we can emulate that and reproduce that in North Georgia as we uh, spread His light. Amen? Amen. So we're going to talk about <clears throat> the land of Israel, the, uh, the other great deception. You all have been hopefully present for the last couple of Shabbats as Rabbi Greg has shared with you the deception of deceptions. <clears throat> How many of you know that um, the world is divided? I, I know that's a news flash to a lot of you. Um, 
But that divide is growing wider and wider and wider. And the gulf between the two sides is growing deeper and deeper and deeper. And the lines have been drawn more clearly than ever. Some would uh, argue that those lines are along political grounds. You have the right, the left, the middle, the side, the up, the down. Some would argue that those lines are divided amongst ideological lines, racial, ethnic. It's not. It's an entirely spiritual divide. And the divide is amongst those who are alive to the reality of the one true God and the truth of His Word. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they are surrendered to that. And there are those that are dead to that reality. It's not political. It's not ideological. And it's our one job to do whatever we can to help those that are dead become alive to God. I think it it certainly falls over into the political and ideological realm. But I can tell you there are many people who are dead to the reality of God on the so-called right And there are many who are alive to the reality of God on the so-called left. It's not who you vote for. It's who you serve. If we are arguing over political and ideological issues, and I see it all the time, Christians, believers, messianics, You're wasting your time. And you're wasting God's time. And potentially, wasting an opportunity to impact someone's eternity. And you can superimpose something else on this divide. It's a clue to see what side people are on. And it's what Rabbi Greg has been talking about over the last couple of weeks. Those who love who and what God loves are on one side. And those who don't are on the other side. I don't care what you call yourself, Christian, Messianic. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Those who do not recognize that the next greatest and final revival will have its epicenter with the Jewish people and that God's covenant with the Jewish nation is eternal and unbreakable. It's His covenant with the Jewish people If you look at those lines, you can see clearly those who are opposed to the people that God loves are on one side. Superimposed on this quote-unquote ideological and political divide. And those who love the people that God loves. But what about this land What about the land known today as Israel? Does God care about the land? The answer is yes and no. I mean, honestly, it's a piece of dirt. This this little land in the middle of a vast sea of Resources, this, this piece of dirt, rock, 
marshland and desert. So why would God care about this place? Well, let's take a journey. And I want to start with this modern day concept, next slide, called Zionism. How many of you have heard that term? Yeah, of course. The Oxford Dictionary calls it a movement that was originally started for the reestablishment and now, presently, for the development and protection of a Jewish nation in what is the modern state of Israel. So it's a movement. Next slide. Zionism comes from the word Zion and and we heard what that word means, but it's actually an ancient biblical Hebrew name for a city called Jerusalem. And it does represent, in that it represents a city, it also represents the people of that city, the Jewish nation. But Zionism in Hebrew, Tzionut, is a philosophy. It's been branded a movement, as we talked about. And it, it, it promotes this commitment to this Jewish nation state in the territory that historically has been defined as the land of Israel. And so where does this term come from? Next slide. It was coined by a man by the name of Nathan Birnbaum in 1890 as they began this organization called the Zionist Movement or the Zionist Organization and they had their first Congress in 1897. Mr. Birnbaum was absolutely convinced as he read Scripture that the prime purpose for this movement was the fulfillment of the spiritual role of the Jewish people and its biblical mandate to re-inhabit the land that God had given to them. This movement, though, changed. And It wasn't very popular politically in in the world to talk about in terms of biblical mandates. And so it became more of a secular movement through Theodore Herzl and then eventually Chaim Weizmann. And so the question I have is, are you a Zionist? As a believer... If so, why? And if not, why not? Again, is it political, this Zionist movement? Do you know that to support Israel, the land, the nation, was uh, popular here in the United States for a long time? It's no longer the majority. In fact, it's becoming more and more the minority for those to support this Zionist movement, this movement that says the Jewish people have a right to their own land. So I ask, and I've seen many, many arguments on social media and so forth, is your stance, if you are a Zionist, a political one? Because if it is, then you have no leg to stand on. Because the entire geopolitical world is opposed and will be more and more opposed to Jewish people holding the right to the land of Israel. And along with the great move of anti-Semitism that is coming and the great deception on the church, on believers, the world will look at the land of Israel in unity with how they look at the Jewish people. And so keep those questions in mind. This is what's going on. Where do you stand? You have Next slide, sorry. Um, one slide ahead of you. Those that believe that Zionism is a form of racism. 
those that believe that everything about Israel is illegal, and those that stand with Israel. Where do you stand? But more importantly, why? If you're defending Israel on political grounds, ideological grounds, your arguments do and will continue to fall on deaf ears, period. People create their own truths, and like sheep, they will follow whoever and whatever piques their fancy. And I can tell you that I've tried to argue in social media for years based on the truth of Israel. Next slide. So for me, is it emotional, this topic? Is it nationalistic? Is it political? You bet. As a Jew whose parents were survivors of the Holocaust and whose father's entire family was murdered in the Nazi death camps, you better believe it's emotional. For my father to have risked his life after World War II to repatriate Jews from Europe, mostly illegally, and if you can, look up the British White Papers, <clears throat> to Palestine, the British colony of Palestine. For my parents to have smuggled arms in in preparation for what they knew was going to be a fight for their survival when they declared independence as they emigrated from Europe to Israel. And my father who fought in Israel's war of independence in 1948, for my cousin who died in 1967 at the end of the Six Day War, you bet it's emotional to support the only place left in the world that actually protects the Jewish people. Is it nationalistic for me? You bet your took us. <laughs> Most of my only surviving family from the Holocaust still lives in Israel, now going on five generations. My parents immigrated from Israel to the U.S. with nothing but the shirts on their backs, and I may be a first-generation American, but I've got Israeli blood flowing through my veins. Is it political? Of course. Like I said, I've seen myself for years as a voice of truth, fairness, equity. When it comes to the misappropriation of history, the outright lies that reasonably intelligent people actually believe as mainstream and social media completely rewrite the history of the Middle East. And as major political power brokers use pro propaganda to spread a revisionist history of Israel as the aggressor for their own gain. Next slide. Do you know there are actually Jewish people who have bought into the lie as part of the progressive woke community of turning lies into truth and truth into lies, that Israel is the big evil, that they're the Goliath, and those around them are the Davids. The world is turned upside down. But so what? So it's emotional for me, so it's nationalistic, <clears throat> so it's political. All of those reasons to be a Zionist may be personally appropriate and historically accurate, but ultimately it makes no difference whatsoever. It is fodder for nothing but dust in the wind. So here is the only reason that supports you or I being a Zionist. Like anything else, If your passion and stance on anything is not based on the counsel of God, the whole counsel of God, if you are not absolutely convinced and rely on the totality of Scripture to support your reason for believing anything, what we believe has no leg to stand on. 
And ultimately, if it's not based on the Word of God, we will be blown off course with the first violent wind of objection. Or just as bad, it'll lead to worthless arguments that end with nothing gained but feeding our own ego. So let's stop. The real question is, next slide, is God a Zionist? What does he say? What does he say about the land of Israel? Does he support a national home for the Jewish people today in 2023 in the land known as Israel? And if not, let's deal with that. Let's admit it and move on. But if he does, we need to share his heart with 100% grace and 100% truth. And use it. If it is God, there's a reason why God is a Zionist. And it's that reason that we're going to explore today. Amen? Amen? Let's go all the way back. Next slide. To the start of it all. Bear sheet. Genesis 12. You ready? We're just getting started. <clears throat> now Adonai said to Avram, get yourself out of your country, away from your kinsmen, and away from your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you are to be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse anyone who curses you and by all the families of the earth, by you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Right? You, you have that, those verses memorized. I know it. That's the Abrahamic covenant. The most important covenant in all of Scripture. The first covenant covenant that's called an eternal covenant and it's about God and his people and so Avram went he didn't sit and think about it he didn't ponder see let's see do I have enough money to make it do I have enough cattle do I have enough what I need he just went as Anonai had said to him they set out, it says Avram was 75 years old, and they set out for the land of Canaan and entered the land of Canaan. Next slide. Adonai said to Avram, after Lot had moved away from him, look all around you from where you are to the north, south, east, and west, all the land you see I will give to you and your descendants. Oh yeah, Forever. And I will make your descendants as numerous as the specks of dust on the earth so that if a person can count the specks of dust on the earth, then your descendants can be counted. Get up and walk through the length and breadth of the land because I will give it to you. Next slide. Forever. The term in Hebrew, ad olam, literally means until eternity. That word olam has no translation in the English language. We do the best we can. We say eternity, we say forever. That word olam is a word that exists outside of time. Think about that. Our world, right? The world we live in is a world of four dimensions. Space and time. Everything has a start and a beginning. Our lives have a start and a beginning, right? If we use our pea brains to see our reality. In God's dimension, in God's reality, there is no time. And so, anytime you hear or see the word olam, pay attention. Because what's that, what's that saying? It's God saying now, Pull your pea brains out of the earthly realm and come into my realm and see reality through my eyes. Because it exists outside of time. 
Next. Then he brought him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. You all know these scriptures. If you can count them, your descendants will be that many. <clears throat> he believed in Adonai and it credited to him as righteousness. Boom! Right? How many chapters in, in the Brit Hadashah, in the writings of the, of the apostles and, and followers of Yeshua talk about the faith of Abraham and that we are following in that faith. Next verse though. Then he said to him, I am Adonai who brought you out from Ur Kazdim to give you this land as your possession. Next slide. In, in that chapter 15, that, that chapter is, is taught in seminaries. It's taught from the pulpits that that in and of itself is the eternal covenant and that God ratified that covenant by this very unique event. Right? God answered him, who? Abraham, right? Bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these, cut the animals in two, and placed the pieces opposite each other, but he didn't cut the birds in half. Birds of prey swooped down on the carcasses, but Avram drove them away. Verse 17, And after the sun had set, and there was thick darkness, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared, which passed between these animal parts. And that is how people believe he ratified the entire Abrahamic covenant, right? That's what we're taught. And it's true to a point. In fact, if you look at systematic theology books where these two quotes are, that's what they say. I'm not going to read these quotes, but this is it. This is where God alone Himself passed through. It was a unilateral covenant. Next slide. But let's look at it a little closer. Next, Genesis 15, verse 7. Next. Yes. Then he said to him, I am Adonai who brought you out from Ur Kastim to give you this land. We just read that. As your possession. And Abraham replied, Adonai, God, how am I to know that I will possess it? And God answered him, bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a dove, and a, pigeon, and a young pigeon. So what he was confirming with this unilateral event was an answer to Abraham's question. How will I know that I will possess the land? Amazing. Next. And he goes on to say, as the sun was about to set, a deep sleep fell on Avram. Horror and great darkness came over him. Adonai said to Avram, know this for certain. And again, he talks about the land. And he prophesies to Avraham what's going to happen to the people, the children of his, his great-grandchildren, right? <clears throat> He said, your descendants will be foreigners in a land that is not theirs. They will be slaves and held in oppression three, there, 400 years. But I will also judge that nation, the one that makes them slaves. We're about to celebrate that. Afterwards, they will leave with many possessions. As for you, you will join your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. Only in the fourth generation... Will your descendants come back here? Because only then will the Imori be ripe for punishment. We could go into that for, for weeks. But again, what frames that event is he's talking about the people in the land. Next slide. And then he says, after the sun set, and there was thick darkness, the smoking fire 
That day, the very next verse, Adonai made a covenant with Avram. I have given this land to your descendants. From the body of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, and on and on. God specifically ratified the land portion of the covenant by walking through the center of the animal part. Why? Because He's God. Because He did it. Period. Full stop. Next. And so based on that Scripture, this is the map of the land promised to Avram. And the blue is... Israel today. The the world does one of two things. They either carve out half of it on the West Bank, what they call the West Bank, or I've seen maps in some encyclopedias say Palestine still. It's going to get worse, folks. Next. We're still only halfway through the first book of the Bible. 24 years later, when Avram was 99 years old, Adonai appeared to Avram and said to him, and you, you know, this is where he changed his name from Avram to, a, to Avraham. He said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Walk in my presence and be pure hearted. I will make my covenant between me and you and I will increase your numbers greatly. And Avram pulled up a beach chair and he grabbed a soda and he said, all right, let's talk, God. No. Avram fell on his face. You can imagine. And God continued speaking with him. As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. Here it is. The great Abrahamic covenant announced in great detail. Your name will no longer be Avram, exalted father, but your name will be Avraham, father of many, because I have made you the father of many nations. I will cause you to be very fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings will descend from you. Next. This is it. I am establishing my covenant between me and you, along with your descendants after you, generation after generation, as an everlasting covenant, Brit Olam. Remember, Olam. Now we're entering into God's realm. No beginning, no end. To be God for you and for your descendants after you. That's it. That was part A. Part B, I will give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are now foreigners, all the land of Canaan, as a permanent possession, and I will be their God. So he said, I am am creating a unilateral, you have to do nothing. I am creating a unilateral, everlasting covenant to be God for you and for your descendants after you. And I will give you and your descendants the land as a permanent possession. Next. That word, that phrase, permanent possession, is the Hebrew phrase, achuzat olam, which literally means an eternal, permanent title deed. Next. What about Yitzchak? That was nice to Abraham, but Abraham had a few children. In fact, he had a child before Isaac, right? Ishmael. So this is in conversation with Isaac, Yitzchak. Stay in this land and I will be with you and bless you because I will give all these lands to you and to your descendants. I will, and hear this, fulfill the oath which I swore to Avraham. I will give you all these lands. 
to your descendants and by your descendants all the nations of the earth will bless themselves. And, verse 5, all this is because Abraham heeded what I said and did what I told him to do. Next slide. What about Jacob? So Yitzchak called Yaakov and after blessing him, charged him. And this is where he said, don't choose a wife from these local kooks. We, we want you to go back to your family and, and choose a wife. right? Verse 4, and may he give you the blessing which he gave Abraham, you and your descendants with you, so that you will possess the land. You will travel through the land God gave to Abraham. That word possess, next slide, is the word yarash. It means in various contexts to occupy, to seize, to inherit, to enjoy, to consume. You will occupy that land. That word occupy has been thrown a lot of around a lot lately. Next slide. <clears throat> Remember this, you know, the, the, the great episode of the, of the land, right? Um, of the ladder in the land. And the angels climbing up and down as, as Yitzhak was moving towards the north. He said, I am Adonai, the God of Abraham, your grandfather, the God of Yitzhak, the land on which you are lying, I will give to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the grains of the dust in the earth. Verse 15, look, I am with you. I will guard you wherever you go, and I will bring you back into this land, because I won't leave you until I have done what I promised you. Next. And so Jacob, on his deathbed, makes Joseph swear to him, this is in Egypt now, fulfilling that prophecy that God gave to Abraham, made Joseph swear to him that he would bury him where? In the land. He said, second part of verse 5, Let's just read all of verse 5. My father and me swear an oath. He said, I am going to die. You are to bury me in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. And then Yosef turns around and says the same thing to his brothers. I'm dying, but God will surely remember you and bring you up out of this land to the land which He swore to Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And then Yosef took an oath from the sons of Israel to carry his bones when that time comes. What's about this land? We can go on. We just barely finished the first book. Exodus. Moses and the Exodus, all about taking people to the land. In fact, they weren't prepared, right? And they sinned, and so they had to wait an extra 40 days, 40 years. How many days journey is it from Sukkot, where they first landed after Egypt, to the land? 11 days. It took them 40 years. Obviously, they didn't have ways. GPS talk. Yes, GPS talk. So, what we hear in a lot of spiritual circles, um, sorry, next, <laughs> and next. Exodus, Leviticus, talking about the land, the land, the land. But there are a lot of people who have argued that because of Israel's disobedience, they no longer have God's blessing or a right of ownership to the land. Well, I hear a lot of murmuring out there. <laughs> Obviously, you guys have not followed, fallen for that great deception. That great deception obviously is an integral part of not only the demonic doctrine of replacement theology, but the argument that many deceived Christians make that Israel does not have a unilateral right to the land because, of course, 
All the Old Testament promises have been invalidated, right? When God says, Olam, He didn't really mean Olam. But it's true, in part. Next slide. God unequivocally tied the obedience of Israel to their ability to possess their land. And there were consequences of their disobedience. Next slide. Leviticus 26. He says, You are not to make yourself any idols, erect a carved statue, or a standing stone, or place a carved stone anywhere in your land in order to bow down to it. I am Adonai your God. Keep my Shabbats and revere my sanctuary. I am Adonai. If you live by my regulations, observe my mitzvot and obey them, I will give you shalom, peace, prosperity, contentment in the land. You will lie down to sleep unafraid of anyone. I will rid the land of wild animals. The sword will not go through your land. I will turn toward you. I will put my tabernacle among you. And I will not reject you. But I will walk among you and be your God. And you will be my people. Reiterating the Abrahamic covenant. Next. Verse 14. But if you will not listen to me and obey all these myths foot, if you loathe my regulations and reject my rulings in order not to obey all of, obey all of them, I'll set my face against you. Now listen to this. Starting with verse 31. I will lay waste to your cities and make your sanctuaries desolate so as not to smell your fragrant aromas. I will desolate the land so that your enemies living in it will be astounded by it. You I will disperse among the nations and I will draw out the sword in pursuit after you. Your land will be a desolation and your cities a wasteland. Then at last, the land will be paid its Shabbats as long as it lies desolate and you are in the lands of your enemy. The land will rest and be repaid at Shabbat. Yes, as long as it lies desolate, it will have rest. The rest it did not have during your Shabbat. Next slide. Later on, he's in Deuteronomy 28, says, And you will be scattered among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. And among these nations, you'll find no ease. The opposite of shalom. And there shall be no rest for the sole of your foot, but the Lord will give you there a trembling heart and falling eye, failing eyes. Oh, my people, my people, my people. And boy, did it happen, right? Your life shall hang in doubt before you. Night and day you shall be in dread and have no assurance for your life. Next. And so we know of the three expulsions, right? The, the, the Jewish diaspora in three different settings. Assyria in the uh, 8th century BC. The Babylonian conquest in that 70 year period in the 6th century. And then the final ultimate destruction of the second temple in the last and greatest Jewish diaspora. 70 AD in the following years. Next slide. And so <clears throat> for, for that time period, not only were Jews completely removed, although there were some you know, small remnants of Jews. They were completely barred from Jerusalem, Zion. And it was even changed to Aelia Capitolini. And that was after Hadrian, because Hadrian's family name was Aelia. And Hadrian was the one who finally put an end to the Bar Kokhba revolt, if you remember your history, and completely decimated the land. Next slide. And so for many centuries, that land did fulfill. Now listen to me. Does God go back on His Word? Even this, this horrible experience, He kept His Word. There are consequences to our decisions and to our choices. But does that change the fact that the Abrahamic covenant, both parts are olam, eternal. And that the title deed to the land is likewise 
forever. It doesn't change a bit. Next slide. No commerce centers. For how long? 1,800 years. 1,800 years. We cry when, when we go a week waiting for our paycheck. 1,800 years, this land was dead. Resting. Next slide. This is a picture of the great Dome of the Rock. That place of worship that's so important to the enemies of Israel in the 1800s. Doesn't look like it's been used very much, has it? Next slide. And in fact, I think uh, even Rabbi Greg talked about this a couple weeks ago, that Mark Twain, um, he wrote a book called The Innocents Abroad based on his travels to the Middle East. And he literally quoted Leviticus 26. He said, To this region one of the prophecies is applied. I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and I will draw out a sword after you. Right? No man can stand here by deserted Ein Melaha, which is a place within the, the borders of now Israel, and say the prophecy has not been fulfilled. Next slide. But, but God. Amos, the great prophet, right? Um, when, when was the book of Amos written? Anybody know? Who was Amos? Context. 750 B.C. He is the first prophet in the Bible. Before all the other prophets that are so famous and that actually come before him in Scripture, he was the first to write a prophecy. And if you've never read, read the book of Amos, oh, do it. Chapter 9, verse 13, The days will come, says Adonai, when the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the one treading grapes, the one sowing seed. Sweet wine will drip down the mountains and all the hills will flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. They will rebuild and inhabit the ruined cities. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine, cultivate gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their own soil. No more to be uprooted from their land which I gave them, says Adonai, your God. There are some people that interpret this since it was 750 that this has got to be talking about, you know, the, the Babylonian purge. Because they did come back. Um, forgot one little phrase when they preached that. No more to be uprooted from their land. This couldn't be talking about that. Next, Jeremiah 31, around 150 years later. <clears throat> right? This is the, uh, the New Covenant. And right after the promise of the New Covenant, he says, this is what Adonai says, who gives the sun as light for the day, who ordained the laws for the moon and stars to provide light for the night, who stirs up the sea until its waves roar. Adonai Tsevaot is his name. If these laws leave my presence, says Adonai, so he did everything. He designed everything. He designed every law that, that this universe, that this earth runs by. The law of gravity, the, the law of thermodynamics, all the, the stuff that people are climbing the mountain of, of quote-unquote intelligence to, to try to, you know, string theory and, and quantum physics and all this stuff. And God says, I designed it all. Y'all don't even have a clue. If the sky above can be measured and the foundations of the earth be fathomed, then I will reject all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, says Adonai. What is he saying? There ain't a snowball chance in H-E double toothpicks that that's going to happen. 
Sorry. That's California for it. It ain't going to happen. Look, the days are coming, says Adonai, when the city will be rebuilt for Adon... For who? For Adonai, from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. The measuring line will be stretched straight to Garav Hill, then turned to Goa. The whole valley of corpses and ashes, including all the fields as far as the Vadi Kidron. Where's the Vadi Kidron? Between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. And on the corner of the horse gate to the east will be separated out for Adonai. It will never be uprooted or destroyed again. This also could not be talking about the Babylonian captivity and that's return. Next. I think I already said this, but I'm going to say it again. Neither the eternal covenant with the children of Israel nor their title deed to the land was, is, or ever will be aborted. We are a privileged generation. Do you realize it? You could have been born in, at any time in history. And you were born for such a time as this. You are born in the day when these prophecies are being fulfilled. Why? One, why are these prophecies being fulfilled? And two, why were you born for such a time as this? The last great return of God's eternal covenant children will not be dependent on anything but the grace and mercy of God. Not their obedience, not their ingenuity, nor their resilience. I don't care what anybody says, including my Israeli family. It will be only by the the right hand of God. <clears throat> Next slide. You guys have these, these scriptures in Romans 9, 10, 11 so memorized, I know. How many hundreds of times has Rabbi read this particular scripture, Romans 11? For brothers, I want you to understand this truth which God formerly concealed but is now revealed so that you, church, listen to this, won't imagine you know more than you actually do. It is that stoniness to a degree has come upon Israel until the Gentile world enters in its fullness. That, if, if you don't know what that phrase enters in its fullness, get the, uh, watch the video from the last time I was here. That's what we focused on. It means enters its fulfillment. And that it is in this way that all Israel will be saved. As the Tanakh says, out of Zion will come the Redeemer. Out of where? Zion. Every, every event in the history of our redemption, from Abraham to Yeshua, part one, to Yeshua part 2 happened and will happen in the land. He will turn away ungodliness from Yaakov and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sin. Verse 28, next. With respect to the good news, they are hated for your sake. But with respect to being chosen, they are loved for the patriarch's sake. For God's free gifts and His calling are irrevocable. And guess what? Just as you yourselves were disobedient to God before, but have received mercy now because of Israel's disobedience, so also Israel has been disobedient now, so that by your showing them the same mercy that God has shown you, they too may now receive God's mercy. It's up to y'all. It's up to us all to get in line with God's plan. That's why you were born for such a time as this. To be part 
of the body of Messiah fulfilling their calling. For God has shut up all mankind together in disobedience in order that He might show mercy to all. Amen? Amen. Next slide. It was around the mid-1800s that Jews from around the world, and primarily Eastern Europe, began to slowly emigrate to the land of their forefathers, often expressing a deep sense of need to go and a feeling of fulfillment when they arrived, even when those times were horrendously hard. There was nothing there. You saw it. It was desolate. They came and tilled rock, tilled marshland, tilled desert. And after a particularly brutal period of persecution in, in Europe and, and Russia before World War I, a group of Jewish leaders, rabbis, intellectuals, and others gathered together for the Zionist Federation that we talked about earlier. It was the beginning. It was the beginning. It was the dead bones rising. Next slide, Ezekiel 37. With the hand of Adonai upon me, Adonai carried me out by His Spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley and it was full of bones. You, y'all, when you, uh, when you were in church pews, maybe in days gone by, how many times did you hear this message? Come on, dry bones, arise! It was preached and preached and still today is preached about you and about the body of, of Christ to rise up. He had me. God had me. Ezekiel passed by all around them. There were so many bones lying in the valley and they were so dry. He asked me, human being, can these bones live? I answered, Adonai Elohim, only you know that. Can you imagine? Ezekiel is minding his own business and God's oh, t- literally... Whatever he did, it transposes him to a place where all he saw was dead bones. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones. Say to them, dry bones, hear what Adonai has to say. To these bones, Adonai Elohim says, I will make breath enter you and you will live. I will attach ligaments, make flesh grow on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you. You will live and you will know that I'm Adonai. Wait a minute, what? And you will know that I am Adonai. Do you know how many times that phrase is, is spoken in just these five or six chapters in the last part of Ezekiel? Starting with chapter 35 to 39? Dozens. So that you will know that I am Adonai. Why is God raising up the Jewish people and placing them back into their land so that the world will know that He is Adonai. That's it. Mic drop. Next slide. Then he said to me, human being, these bones are what? The whole house of Israel. And they are saying, our bones have dried up, our hope is gone, and we are completely cut off. Therefore, prophesy, say to them that Adonai Elohim says, my people, I will open up your graves and make you get out of your graves. And I will bring you into the land. The dry bones rising prophecy was not fulfilled until Israel is in the land. That began in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s. And for the first time in 2,000 years, More Jews live in the land of Israel than live outside of the land of Israel. For the first time in 2,000 years. 
Verse 13, then you will know that I am Adonai. When I have opened your graves and made you get up out of your graves, my people, I will put my spirit in you and you will be alive. Sounds pretty unilateral here. Then I will place you. Wait, I thought that it was the resilience of this people, this, these Jewish people, you know? They were just tough people, right? Uh uh-uh. uh. Should have been dead. Gone, my people, I should not be here. My father barely escaped at age 15 and his entire family. Literally, I'm I'm not exaggerating. Every one of his family was murdered. He was the only one of 30 that survived. My mom watched as her father was was arrested by the Gestapo and they never saw him again. They hid for five years in rat-infested, you know, rooms. And time and time again, they escaped barely. I should not be here. Why am I here? Hallelujah. Preach it. And you will know that I, Adonai, have spoken and that I have done it, says Adonai. And so these Zionists next lobbied long and hard for this recognition. They actually were tried, they, they tried to convince him that they should not look at the land, you know, known as Israel, but they, they had land put aside in, in Zimbabwe. In, in various places in Africa. And God had to redirect them. Thousands of Jews began emigrating to their former national homeland, even though there was persecution among the indigent Arab population and, and also the British colonialists. Next slide. I think I'm done with my introduction. All right. <clears throat> the Balfour Declaration. Any, anybody hear of that? 1917, the British um, Secretary of State, Lord uh, Arthur James Balfour, wrote a letter to, the, to Lord Rothschild, said His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Great. Next slide. That didn't go very far very fast. In the land that they promised, which included what is today Israel and most of Jordan, kept getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. Why? Because the Arabs discovered oil. And the British and the rest of the world needed it. And so... The Jews? And you know what happened in the Great Holocaust. Right? Next slide. Six million were exterminated. Nearly 50% of the world's Jewish population. And after World War II, Jews began emigrating to what was then British Palestine by the thousands, by the thousands, from all over the world, illegally. Next slide. Resolution 181, United Nations General Assembly finally took pity on the Jews and said, fine, just tell them to shut up, we'll give them their land, I know they they lost a lot of people and um, we had a lot to do with it. And they voted 33 verses 13 to give this little piece of land, the yellow or the uh, light yellow part, to the Jewish people. So what happened? Next slide. I love this. Has anybody actually read the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel? I'm going to read part of it to you. What does Eretz Israel mean? The land of Israel. 
The land of Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here they first attained to statehood, created cultural values of national and universal significance, and gave to the world the eternal book of books. After being forcibly exiled from their land, the people kept faith with it throughout their dispersion and never ceased to pray and hope for their return to it. This right was recognized in the Balfour Declaration and reaffirmed in the mandate of the League of Nations. On the 29th November 1947, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution calling for the establishment of the Jewish state in Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. Accordingly, we, members of the People's Council, representative of the Jewish community of the land of Israel, hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in the land of Israel to be known as the State of Israel, placing our trust in the Rock of Israel. We affix our signatures on this proclamation at this session of the Provisional Council of State on the soil of the homeland in the city of Tel Aviv on this Shabbat Eve, the fifth day of ER, 5708, 14th of May. It's going to be 75 years this May. And then what happened? Next. Yeah. Five Arab nations attacked the fledgling Jewish state. And of course, because they had such powerful arms and and had so many, you know, um, soldiers, no? They were outgunned, outmanned, out everything. And that they will know that I am Lord. 19, amen. 1967, multiple Arab nations were amassing ten thousands of troops, tens of thousands, massive military strength, and Somehow Israel said, you know what? We ain't waiting for them to attack this time. We knew that, they knew that there were days before that. My brother actually was in Israel at that time, visiting family for the, for the summer when the war broke out. He had to hold the hand of, of my cousin's wife and tell her the news when my cousin was murdered by an Arab mine as a hero. He saw the mine and he saw um, several hundred troops, Israeli troops, marching towards it and he drove his bus over the mine and detonated it before they could get there. And somehow... Israel, who again was outnumbered and outgunned. I mean, they were minutes from Cairo. They were minutes, a few miles from Damascus. And somehow they won. And that year, not only did they win the war, but they took uh, Zion, Jerusalem. And what's happened since then? Thousands murdered. Multiple thousands of missiles fired on Israel's civilian population. Terrorists. And very, very soon, folks. Next slide. You think it's bad now. You think the Holocaust was bad. What's going to happen next will make the Holocaust look like a party. These are our Jewish brothers and sisters, and this is the land. He said, I will make Yerushalayim a cup one more time that will stagger the surrounding peoples. Even Yehuda will be caught up in the siege against Yerushalayim. When that day comes, I will make Yerushalayim a heavy stone for all the people. All who try to lift it will hurt themselves. But listen... All the earth's nations will be massed against her. Has that ever happened? No. That prophecy is talking about what is to come. This is the day, this is the age that we're living in. This is the day that you were born. What are you going to do about it? Zion. 
Zechariah 14, a couple chapters later. Look, a day is coming for Adonai when your plunder, your Shalim, will be divided right there within you. For I will gather all the nations against Yerushalayim for war. Then Adonai will go out and fight against those nations, fighting as on a day of battle. On that day, His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies to the east of Yerushalayim. And the Mount of Olives, like the, the Sea of Reeds, will split in half from east to west to make a huge valley. Then Adonai, my God, will come to you with all the Holy ones. Next. So you human being, Ezekiel 39, prophesy against Gog. Say that Adonai Elohim says, I am against you, Gog. I will turn you around, lead you on, and bring you from the far reaches of the north against the mountains of Israel. But then I will knock your bow out of your left hand and make your arrows drop from your right hand. You will fall on the mountains of Israel. You, your troops, and all the peoples with you. Next, this thus will I display my glory among the nations so that all the nations will see my judgment. Talk about the Exodus making an impact on Egypt. Imagine this. On the entire... How many nations? Will see my judgment when I executed in my hand when I laid on them. From that day on, the house of Israel will know that what? I am Adonai their God. While the Goyim will know that the house of Israel went into exile because of their guilt, because they broke faith with me, so that I hid my face from them and handed them over to their adversaries, and they fell by the sword, all of them. Yes, I treated them as their uncleanness and crimes deserve, and I hid my face. Next. Therefore, Adonai Elohim says this, Now I will restore the fortunes of Yaakov and have compassion on the entire house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name. They will bear their shame and all their guilt from breaking faith with me once they are living securely in their land with no one to make them afraid. This will be after I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, thereby being consecrated through them in the sight of many nations. Next. Exclamation point here. Then they will know that I am Adonai their God, since it was I who caused them to go into exile among the nations, and it was I who regathered them where? Their own land. I will leave none of them there anymore. I will no longer hide my face from them, for I have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says Adonai Elohim. Next. So Scripture has at least 170 references to the land that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that word land, as you know, is Eretz. It's a physical thing. The earth, ground, land. It's not an ethereal land that some people want to turn it into. Next. 55 times the Bible records that God reaffirmed the promise of the land with an oath. Do you know what... And, and we've read that, and I said, remember this term. God affirmed it with an oath. You know what the, the term with an oath is in Hebrew? It's the term kum shvua. Kum shvua literally means to raise a seven. Sheva, shvua. In, in a Hebraic mind, when you make an oath, you proclaim something seven times. And so, if we think about it, we saw Kum Shvua 55 times, which means that 385 times God proclaimed with an oath that the land belonged to the children of Abraham. And 12 of those times, He stated that the promise was eternal. The land provides a stage, uh, a stage on which Almighty God has always, is currently, and will forever carry out His plan of redemption. Since the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable, and Israel would never cease to be a nation before Him, according to Jeremiah, their possession of this land is everlasting. Indeed, God's faithfulness to this covenant is held up before us. 
as believers in the book of Hebrews, as proof that He will be faithful to the promises made to us in the new covenant. And so if He's aborted His covenant with the Jewish people, we have no hope. And that's what Hebrews says. Next slide. For when God made His promise to who? Avraham. That's where we started this journey. He swore an oath to do what He had promised. And since there was no one greater than Himself for Him to swear by, He swore by Himself and said, I will certainly bless you and I will certainly give you many descendants. And so, after waiting patiently, Avraham saw the promise fulfilled, at least in the birth of Isaac. Now people swear oaths by someone greater than themselves and confirmation by an oath puts an end to all dispute. Therefore, when God wanted to demonstrate still more convincingly the unchangeable character of His intentions to those who were to receive what He had promised, He added an oath to the promise. Next. So that through two unchangeable things, the promise and the oath, in neither of which God could lie, we who have fled to take a firm hold on the hope set before us would be strongly encouraged. We have this hope as a sure and safe anchor for ourselves. A hope that goes right on through to what is inside the parochet, the Holy of Holies, where a forerunner is entered on our behalf, namely Yeshua, who has become a Kohen Gadol forever to be compared with Melchizedek. The... The fact that God has demonstrated that He has kept His eternal, eternal promise repeatedly confirmed by an oath and we are living in the day that we see His promise fulfilled is the greatest physical evidence, the greatest physical witness to us as believers, to the Jewish people as a whole, and to the nations of the world that God is real. That His love is eternal. His promises are true. And we are without excuse. Amen. And when the nations of the world stage their final attempt to annihilate the Jewish people and to destroy the land, God will prove once and for all that He is God. And that He is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Full stop. And so, next slide. So the question is, is God a Zionist? Yeah. You bet. Are you a Zionist? Yeah. You better be. Yeah. If so, why? Because God is and His Word confirms it through promises kept confirmed by an oath time and time again. And if not, why not? If you're not, you're deceived. Period. And if you're watching and you're not sure, or you're mocking, or you're blowing this off, I entreat you with all the love in my heart to be very, very careful. Look at these issues soberly. You don't want to be on the wrong side of history. But way more importantly, you don't want to be on the wrong side of God. Next slide. God's promises are to a thousand generations. He who watches over Israel with neither slumber nor sleep. Amen? Amen. This nation keeps suffering and they will suffer one more time. But they will cry out. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. And he'll be there. No longer the Lamb of God. He'll be there as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Stand with me. Let's praise Him. Hallelujah.
Wow. God is a Zionist, and I hope you can say you're a Zionist. He is the God of all hope, and we have the hope, and that hope is what the world needs. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you his peace. Yo e Adonai pone veleka ve huneka Isa Adonai pone veleka ve asem leka Shalom Shabbat Shalom, go with God <laughs> <laughs>